Hi guys, it seemed to me that you guys really enjoyed the video that I made about some of the original ideas for an Alien sequel instead of the James Cameron Aliens that we got several years later. Alien 3 went through many different scripts and drafts before Fox settled on what would eventually become the Alien 3 that we know of, for better or for worse. The first script writing for Alien 3 was offered to William Gibson, who was well known for his popular novel The Neuromancer in which he helped usher in the cyberpunk design era. I learned that once again we can blame the studio, Fox, as well as Brandywine for most of the issues that led to the less well received Alien 3 movie. The co-producers for the movie were David Geiler and Walter Hill who worked on both of the earlier Alien films. The sad part to me is that with sequels, it is too often true that the studios choose to invest less money with each movie and rely on the built up name and characters in order to sell tickets. They expect each movie to make less money and thusly invest less money and less time onto each one. This just infuriates me, I mean how the hell do they expect to carry on a franchise this way? Well in short, they don't. Even though everyone in the public was excited for another entry into the Alien franchise, the co-producers were not as enthused. The studio wanted them to produce another film, but they were quoted as saying that they were sick of it and wanted to end the whole thing. After the success of Alien, Aliens, and all of the merchandising, this has got to be the dumbest idea I've ever heard. They liked the way that Alien was an almost straight up horror movie with just one single alien, and then they also liked the follow up in which Cameron won up the game with a more action packed movie with multiple aliens. The producers knew they couldn't repeat the methods from the first two movies and wanted to go in a new direction. It's this process that gave you Alien 3 and 4, a studio thinking that they can't repeat a movie's settings and still make it its own movie. That's why we got such drastically different movies with Alien 3 and 4. I really do think they could have reused the movie genres again, and if writing and characters were there, the movies would have had a better chance to appeal to fans than those last two sequels with trying to make a whole different take on the movie than the first two offered. Some of the early ideas tossed around by Geiler and Hill were just straight up crazy. The first idea had the aliens invading Earth where they would fuse into a giant multi-talented monster that attacks New York. So basically Godzilla meets aliens, sort of. That would have just been freaking horrible and these are the two guys that say everything's already been done with Alien and then they go off to try to copy a Godzilla flick. Another idea that they had involved Ripley and Newt in a Blade Runner-esque city hunting down the aliens. Eventually the two producers met and hired William Gibson, who wanted to use the Blade Runner city idea, but was told that due to budget constraints he couldn't go in that direction. Brandywine Studios had suggested that Gibson use a more Marxist spaced empire route, so he ended up using a Cold War and space theme for the script, whereas the alien replaces nuclear bombs and an arms race. Although there are a few writers to end up writing drafts for Alien 3, we're going to focus on the most complete of the drafts, William Gibson's first draft for Alien 3. This draft would follow up with Hicks, Newt, and Ripley. Michael Bean would end up taking the lead role in the film. Newt would have a smaller part, and Ripley would be in stasis the entire film. Sigourney Weaver had stated she didn't want to return to the franchise. They were hoping to convince her for the follow-up, in which they would have her wake up in order to face off against the aliens again. The first movie would open up with the Sulaco on its return journey to Earth from LV-426. Unfortunately, due to a possible navigation error, the ship would enter a region of space controlled by the Union of Progressive Peoples, a group similar to that of the Soviet Union. This group is involved in a Cold War and arms race with an unnamed faction, presumably including the United States and the Colonial Marines. The UPP's forces board the Sulaco and end up being attacked by a facehugger 
that, and get this, has grown from the genetic material deposited from the alien queen in Bishop's severed torso. This is a really interesting way of growing a facehugger, and even slightly reminiscent of the black goo in the prequel movies. The facehugger and facehuggy are both killed and ejected into space in order to prevent further ship damage from the acid blood. We then pick up with the Sulaco arriving at Anchor Point Station, which is controlled by Waylon Yutani. The station is huge, being described as the size of a small moon. They are met at the station by a team of colonial marines and scientists, along with a science tech named Tully. Once they enter the Sulaco, however, they are attacked by two warrior aliens in the hypersleep area. Two marines are killed in the battle, but the two warrior aliens are taken out by a flamethrower. Unfortunately though, Ripley's cryotube is severely damaged by the flamethrower and even though she survived, she is now in a deep coma, allowing us to go on with the movie with an understanding as to why she won't be in the film. Tully and the rest of the team end up finding xenomorph genetic material on Bishop's severed legs and they secretly start experimenting on it. This is ordered by Fox and Wells, two people working for Waylon Yutani. Next we come to Hicks, and he is being looked at by a technician named Spence. She's not a medic, she actually works in the tissue culture lab. She ends up telling Hicks that she needs a sample and proceeds to test him for infection. We then see Newt enter the lab after biting and escaping from another lab tech who then enters the room to grab her again. Hicks gets in between Newt and the orderly and threatens him. Spence then tries to defuse the situation by asking if the two would like to visit Ripley who is still in her coma. The film would now cut to the Rodina, or the UPP ship in which they are examining the top half of Bishop. We see a team of techs going over the readouts, graphs, and formulas as a detailed anatomical drawing of a face hugger looms on the monitor. Even more interesting though is back at Anchor Point where we see two techs inspecting Bishop's legs which are infected with dark globules and one tech asks the other, since when do androids get diseases? I can't help but wonder if the dark globule idea somehow influenced the black goo that we've come to know from Prometheus and Covenant. We pick back up with Hicks finally as he's being debriefed by Colonel Rossetti of the Colonial Marines and several Wei-Yu agents. It turns out that this future Cold War may be using traditional weapons, but both sides are also working on a better weapon to have, the alien. Hicks is told that the entire mission from aliens will be looked at as a hostile act in order to weaponize the xenomorph or otherwise use it for genetic studies. Later on, Newt ends up leaving the station on a now thought to be decontaminated Sulaco bound for Earth so that she can live with her grandparents, a much better ending for Newt than the one we got in the Alien 3 movie. Hicks is then given a job by a guy named Walker in a machine shop and eventually he starts to hear rumors of experiments on the aliens from Spence. Back on the Rodina again, we see people discussing what they have now learned from the aliens. They know that the alien can be made into a weapon if the genetic material can be controlled. The UPP knows that this material cannot fall into the hands of Waylon Yutani, and they want the material for themselves, so they repair Bishop and return him to Anchor Point as a fake showing a friendship and to give them more time in order to clone the alien. Upon returning, Bishop is taken in for questioning by the Marines. We then enter the tissue lab where they're analyzing human and alien DNA. They watch as the alien form makes contact with the human DNA, transforming it quickly into an alien-human hybrid DNA. Later, Hicks runs into Tully at the bar on the station, which is located in a mall-type shopping area. Tully, after some drinks and inebriation, tells Hicks that they know about the infestation on the Sulaco, but says that they'll talk about it more the next day. The Marines and the Wei Yu Techs then analyze Bishop and come to the conclusion that the UPP didn't tamper with his programming, but that they also know that the UPP most likely tried to access his memories of the alien. 
The way you text then state the obvious use of alien DNA and bioweapon research and decide to go forward with their own research under the guise of studying the alien DNA for human medical research. Bishop, who is now out of his questioning with the Marines, ends up meeting with Hicks to let him know about the queen alien that boarded the Sulaco from the last movie. He theorizes that the queen may have deposited some of her genetic material on the ship before being shot out into space by Ripley. Bishop then informs Hicks of the company's plans to clone the aliens and they begin working on a plan to stop Weyland yutani Okay guys, and that's going to be a good place for us to call this part one of the original William Gibson Alien 3 script. We'll pick up next time with part two where we'll finish up the story. If you guys have any questions or comments, let me know down below. I hope you're enjoying the script so far. If you are, if you could leave a like, it helps out the channel so much. And if you haven't subscribed yet, why not for all the alien content to come in the future? Thanks again for watching everybody. Take care and I will see you next time.